Welcome back to our fourth video on our series on biomimicry. Today I'm really excited to share with you someone who does his work in the biomimicry field. He started off as a biologist and then really became fascinated by the, the innovations that nature had to offer. So in today's video, we are going to hear from Sam Steer. As you listen to him, think about the tools that biologists might use, engineers might use, kids might use, anyone looking to define a problem and find solutions. What kinds of things do you find fascinating? What kinds of things do you wonder about? And can those things possibly influence a future invention? In our next video, I'll ask you to become a designer, to become an inventor, and to use what you've learned from the natural world to influence your design. So let's hear from Sam. Today we are meeting with Sam Steer. He is the executive director of the Center for Learning with Nature. Um, thank you so much, Sam, for talking to us today. You bet, you bet. I'm glad to be here. Was there a certain moment that you felt like you were like, wow, this is such a cool field. I have to be involved in this. Or did it just kind of happen gradually over time? I'm a biologist by training. So for years, I studied different creatures and that sort of thing. And then um, I didn't really think of biology and the study of nature as having anything to do with the, the technological world, the world of humans and all the things that we, that we build. Um, and then I uh, just happened to hear a presentation by a woman who wrote a book about learning from nature, how to improve our technologies. And that completely blew my mind. I never thought of biology as being connected to the world that we all, you know, live in. And suddenly it's just opened up this whole world that has never stopped unfolding where, where there's more to learn and it's more connections to be made all the time. The way I, I grew up, you know, I always liked nature, but I never, you know, nature was pretty, it was interesting, it was fun to explore, but I never thought of it as teaching us anything about how we do things, how we make things, what we can even imagine making. So it's, it just is a different way of thinking about nature that, that at least I wasn't very used to. Um, but now I can't really stop thinking of nature that way. Yeah. Well, speaking of books, this is Sam's book, Engineering Education for the Next Generation. And I just think this is fascinating. Um, if you're a teacher watching, this is a great resource. Um, shows some really cool imagery. This is one of my favorites when you compare the structure of bone to the building of the Eiffel Tower. Um, I wondered, are there any of your, um, are there any nature's talents that stick out to you as some of the most fascinating? Well, I, I keep running across new ones. Actually, just uh, yesterday I was reading, I don't know why I bumped into this, but I was reading about this certain molecule um, and it, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled G-E-O-S-M-I-N. So maybe Geosmin or something because it, it's the smell apparently of when it rains, you know, there's that kind of smell, that yeah. earthy smell. And um, I was reading about how humans have this incredible ability to detect that particular molecule. Like uh, we can, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's, it's a few parts per trillion, which is really, really sensitive. It, the article I read said that that was basically humans could smell this molecule. Um, they were better at smelling that mo molecule by about 200,000 times the ability of a shark to detect blood in the water. So we're really, really good at detecting this molecule. And then I started wondering, why are we so good at detecting that one molecule? So I tried to read a little bit about it and it's a molecule that gets real, it's in the dirt, a bacteria makes it and um, it can get released when it rains. And, and you know, the, no one really knows why we're so good at detecting it, but I was wondering whether it could simply be that water is really important to us. And if it rains somewhere in our environment, uh, maybe, you know, it's good that we could detect it and walk towards the water source. So I don't know, I, I don't really know. But anyway, that's just one tiny example of all the things in nature that nature's so good at, just that one happens to be something humans are really good at. You know, trees, I'm always interested in trees. I always like trees. The 
strength of uh, cellulose and cellulose is you know the main part of wood and if you the stretching strength they call it the tensile strength of cellulose it's it's as strong as uh, high tensile steel like wow. it's really strong you know and and um, the other thing is that that he wrote is that it's cellulose is only a seventh as dense as steel so it's as strong as steel in terms of stretching strength but you know it's a seventh the, the density and it's just amazing things wow. like that you know and you kind of think about well yeah a tree's up there it's got all its branches and all its leaves and when the wind blows it's got to bend a little bit and it can't afford to just crack and break so it has to be able to stretch and be really strong um, and so when you start to think about all the things that nature goes through um, then you start to understand oh yeah you know it makes sense that it's so good at all of these different things that it does um, but again you know we don't we don't really think of that firsthand nature's just pretty it's just out there and we don't think of all the amazing challenges it faces and it's really good at dealing with I have other ones I could keep going on a few others but yeah let me um, one more. oh yeah one. please yes <laughs> please this one I love and and um, I can't remember where I read this I think it might have been from the same plant biomechanics book but um, I guess grasses, you know how grasses in the wind, you know, they'll kind of be bobbing back and forth. Well, it turns out that grasses are actually doing something when they do that. And um, what is happening is that the wind is blowing and all the, the grass has to collect pollen from other grasses in order to make it seeds. And the, it, the pollen is in the wind, but the grass is kind of small and the air is really big and pollen's tiny. So how does it, you know, how does the grass catch any pollen? One thing that helps it is the wind blows and then it goes, wraps around the, the top of the grass blade. And back here on the other, you know, where the wind's not blowing as hard, there's kind of like a little eddy, um, a little still area. And so the pollen grains that are in the air kind of collect over here and the grass uh, blade you know, with the flowers and up at the top, it's bobbing back and forth. And it's actually bobbing into this little eddy back here. Wow. And it's almost like it's fishing for the pollen grains that get trapped here wow. as it's bobbing. Yeah, like, you know, you'd never think that grass in the wind is doing anything, right. but it is. Just run right over it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't think about it, but it's amazing. It's something is happening right there. Yeah, that's so cool. And it, it sounds like when you get invested in this field that you, it's almost like the most fascinating piece is the new one that you discover each day or week because there's always more to learn. So that's in yeah. itself is just pretty fascinating that there's really not an end um, yeah. to the amount of knowledge that you can gather. Very cool. Okay, what are some of your favorite examples of ways people in the past have used biomimicry for inventions? Ooh, there's a lot of those too. There's so many. Um, I really like this one invention by a designer named Toshi Fukaya. And um, it's a really simple invention and it's something that we all kind of can relate to because he changed the way thumbtacks can be made. And he's a designer, so he um, he would, you know, in school, they would put their work on the wall with thumbtacks mm -hmm. uh, to show to the rest of the class. And whenever he would reach into the box of thumbtacks, his, his finger would sometimes get pricked by the thumbtack. And he really didn't like that. Wow. So it kind of bugged him. And, and then he just one day was playing with his cat and he really noticed how his cat had these claws, but that, you know, the paws of his cat could be really soft as long as the cat had retracted the claws. Mm -hmm. And so it, it started to make him think, well, what if you know you had a thumbtack that could kind of do something like that? And what he did is he designed a thumbtack that uh, just looks like a normal thumbtack, but it's kind of in an, uh, a clear envelope of a compressible material, a silicon. So you, it's kind of like a little oval and you, you compress it right into the wall and it acts just like a thumbtack. But when you pull it out, the compressible part kind of resumes its shape and that encircles that metal pin so it's it's a smooth um you know oval uh object that doesn't prick you and it's just such a cool idea and it came from him playing with his cat i yeah. love that one 
That's great. And just finding something that bugs you, you know, so it doesn't <laughs> have to be something that's like necessarily going to change the world, but it relieves you of that little annoyance of, of poking your fingers in the thumbtack. So I love that this person started off with just something that bugged him because oftentimes yeah. I think that's how inventions are just, you know, improving um, a current invention and an innovation uh, can really get started with just something that bugs you. Um, okay, so uh, thinking about ways that biomimicry has been used in the past, are there some certain ways that it's being used now that you're excited about? Yeah, a lot. Um, so you, you might think, I don't know, you might get the idea that only engineers use biomimicry, but um, the more you look at all the things that are happening in the world, you realize that so many different uh, people doing so many different kinds of jobs use biomimicry now. Uh, it's really, it's hard to find any human activity or, or endeavor where someone isn't using biomimicry. Um, like maybe it's a, a a paint company that makes different kinds of paint. They might be looking at how nature uh, creates all the colors that it has. Or maybe it's um, an automotive designer like Tesla or you know Chevrolet or these companies. And they are looking to nature. They're trying to learn from nature how to make their cars uh, stronger and lighter and more efficient and so on. Uh, there's a really neat uh, project uh, by an engineer named John DeBerry. And he has been improving uh, how, how much energy wind turbines can put out. And um, he's been experimenting with different ways of arranging wind tur turbines. Usually the, the wind in a, that comes, a, you know, goes through a wind turbine can kind of make the other wind turbines not work as well. Um, so he wondered if, if you could improve the way the wind turbines interact with one another. And he started to look at how fish uh, and the ocean school together because um, a lot of the fish that school they actually are using those disturbances caused by the fish in front of them in order to swim more efficiently so oh, wow. we thought well that could be a really cool you know model for trying to think about how to arrange wind turbines differently and so he's experimented with this and uh, he's come up with arrangements of wind turbines that put out like 10 times the amount of energy uh, that wind turbine arrays used to put out wow. and he learned it he learned it from fish schools learned it from fish yeah 10 times his was 10 times so that's like a thousand percent it's insane wow. it's absolutely insane yeah no i know absolutely mind-boggling yeah i don't know how you know those inventors are just amazing how they they will have a problem in front of them and like you know wind the wind of wind turbines interfering with other wind turbines and then they'll start to think about things in nature that have already solved that kind of problem, like fish schooling together. And right. yeah, then sure enough, they find the answers. Right, you could be just an engineer who normally may not just spend your day doing biomimicry or looking to nature or claim to you know, have any expertise in that area, but then it just comes out of you trying to solve a problem. So you just might find that as inspiration, even though it's not really your field. Yeah, and that's one thing I think it makes that makes it so fun for engineers because they, you know, when they start looking to nature, they may not be a biologist or have a biology background or any of that stuff, but there's so much information and so many people that can help you that you can find new information that normally wouldn't come to you unless you start looking in those directions. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then you're starting to learn about whole new worlds that that other people aren't even aware of. And I think it makes it really fun for those kind of inventors and engineers, um, you know, to work that way. Um, so if someone is interested in biomimicry, how would, would you suggest they get started on inventions or innovation? Where do they begin? Well, I always think the first thing is to just go outside and start asking some questions. You know, like why, why is something the way it is that you see? And, and just try to think about you know what that organism needs to do what what kind of challenges it confronts on a daily basis and then i think the answers start to appear or at least the you know the hypotheses start to appear like well maybe um you know this organism is shaped this way because it has to deal with this and once you can start to ask yourself those questions then you you have a world that starts to open up to you because what wasn't he so interesting so now it's your turn Get out those sketchbooks again 
and sketch down some of your favorite ideas that you heard Sam talk about today. Maybe they'll be used in your design. Sam said the best way to get started in biomimicry is just to start asking questions. So as always, go outside, look around. What are you wondering about? Write those wonderings down in your journal or in your sketchbook somewhere and start to dig a little deeper. Another thing inventors do is they think about what bugs them. It can be a big problem or it can be a really tiny problem, just like the thumbtack. What problem do you want to solve? Start thinking, because in our next video, I'll ask you to become the inventor.